Four individuals in the captive insurance population versus over 300 eastern quolls in the captive insurance population. Population numbers on the wall. You look around the devil, it's 15 to 20,000 and stabilizing. Depends how you can look at that. Stabilizing is not decreasing, but it's also not increasing. Um, and prior to DFD, we had somewhere between 100 to 150,000 devils here in Tassie. So if, when we say the population is reduced by 90%, is not an understatement. In the case of your spotter quolls, whole entire range from Queensland to Tasmania, 14,000 individuals left out in the wild and two thirds of them are found down here in Tassie. In the case of Easter quolls, they are the most endangered species we house here. They cover 90, they've lost, uh, been lost over. Um, around over 95% of their range. We've lost over 95% of their population. Only exists down here in Tassie now. 10,000 left in the wild and still declining. So if you think about it, right now, there are more devils here in Tasmania than spotted quolls from Queensland to Tasmania. Right now, there are more devils in Tasmania than there are eastern quolls in Tasmania. But barely you knows what quolls are. And it's a shame because right now is a high chance we'll lose our easterns before we lose our devils. And it's not because the quolls aren't awesome. They are absolutely formidably awesome animals. But they don't get the attention they deserve because they don't have that cool cachet of DFTD. That disease is so rare. A lot of research is applied to that. And in turn, the byproduct is we know so much more about devils. And our understanding of devils is so much more comprehensive than it is on about our quolls. But unfortunately for quolls, their threats are quite boring, right? And most animals on the planet, it's all from humans. Habitat loss being a major issue for them. And the introduction of feral pests, foxes and cats. Now, we do not have foxes here in Kazi. And if we did, we wouldn't have the amount of wildlife we have here. We definitely wouldn't have our beautiful eastern quolls. But what we do have here in Tasmania is an overabundance of feral cats. With some estimates say that our feral cat population is about the same as our human population, which is roughly half a million. Excellent. Got to be proud of something, guys. Alrighty guys, so that kind of gives you a bit of a synopsis, a bit of background information on what we do here and why we do what we do here at Sanctuary. Um, before we get into the thick of the tour and we start feeding some of our devils, um, I have to give you a couple of safety warnings. You are made out of me, guys. These animals eat meat. You can probably do the math. You can probably keep those two things far apart, we're going to be fine. In the case of devils, they can actually jump a metre high and relative body size is stronger than your pressure in the animal kingdom. It's a pound, pound, kilo, kilo. So if you go and reach in for a pack or try and touch a quoll, then you are probably going to not lose, lose your limb or your fingers, but probably use the tip or the use of your hung hand or your arm or something like that. <laughs> it's about an hour away to the nearest hospital, guys, so you basically have a very... But we're not far, it's a ton. It's a ton. It's a ton of meat a month, so about 250 gram, grams a week we go through. So you can see where we're consistent. You can come a bit closer, if you want. You can see where we're consistent, healthy, reliable source of meat, can't you? Mm. So how do you get rid of toxic risk? Well, generally you can actually identify an animal toxic because because they go blind if they're not bumping into things. Then they probably know they probably don't have toxo, but to doubly make sure we freeze that meat for three days and that eliminates that toxo risk as well. We know that these three species make a big chunk. Sorry, I'm gonna actually have to throw something right over back. Oh, someone was missing Leave mine. Pick on your own side. Yeah. So we know that these three species make a big chunk of a, wild, a devil's wide diet for a couple of different reasons. One, we have so many of those species. We have about 10 million pally mounds that live here in Tassie and only about 550,000 people. And guys, that's the ratio it should be. The reason why we have so many herbivores in Tasmania though, is the significant lack of top order predators. So your top order predator, your top dude in the ecosystem would have been your Tasmanian tiger. Does anyone know what happened to Tasmanian tigers? Why are they extinct guys? Why do they kill them? Fur. Do you reckon they really were hunting the sheep? No. No, they weren't at all. Complete rubbish. They also said devils were hunting their sheep. <laughs> no. No. So we now know thylacines or Tasmanian tigers were never a threat to sheep. And we know that by looking at their skull mechanisms and so forth, that we said they didn't have the power of bringing down a sheep. 
definitely a dead one, most definitely. Same as devils, they don't have the ninja skills or the vision to bring down a perfectly good healthy sheep. Definitely a dead one though. So shepherds will see these guys eating their dead, love, dead livestock go, they're eating, they're hunting our livestock. Grazing companies put bounty on the pelts and you have to understand guys, this wasn't just your average farmers shooting devils and tazzy tigers. It was your average Joe person. Reason being, they were impoverished people. They had kids to feed. Someone offered them some money so they could More put food vision, in. We could sit smell. The other thing I've got is the wicked of hearing. Now in the case of devils, every single devil has their own distinctive voice. A common misconception people have about devils is that they go, oh, they've got different patterns. That must be how they identify to us. No, that's how we identify them. But that's not why they have different markings. But they recognize each other through their voice. That's how they recognize as keepers, is through our voice. That's how I can jump into enclosure, because they recognize my voice. So the case of that jaw pressure, they will utilize that to as much as they can in a short amount of time. Because if they rock up to a carcass and they're the only one there, jackpot. So they get as much as they can in a short amount of time before anyone else rocks up, because generally other devils will smell that. And when they conquer our food, they're going to vocalise. So people always think devils are aggressive because how they talk to each other. Because people don't understand devils. But people who've been here, put some humans talk and think they're aggressive because people don't understand what they are. Can I explain that? I'll talk about it. In regards to when devils conquer our food, they kind of want to sort out their issues before it escalates. Because they're so phenomenally powerful, they can inflict a lot of damage to each other. You generally don't see that in captivity, and we have to manage accordingly to try and reduce that. That's why there's three males in this enclosure, because they're all of reproductive age, and we're in breeding season, which means we're all piped up in testosterone right now, and they can be quite compatible with each other. So they've got that dual pressure, we eat as much as they can, short amount of time, they can get a third of their body weight in one session. Now, if you think these kids in here are averaging about 10, 10 and a half kilos, I mean, we're to what about 11 kilos, actually, 11 kilos. So you can see how that's a lot of meat and bone at 20 and a half now. So is he the more dominant male? No, he's just the biggest. So not dominant, he's not dominant, he's just the biggest. Does that make sense? So there's the fact that he's a big sort of big body now. In the case of, I mean, fully explain that. So when devils come together and food, basically it's not about how big you are and how small you are, it depends on things. And you're the devil, you're actually afraid to be them, so they actually avoid them. In regards to this, what's going on right now, he's just peckish and he's hungry. So basically, when they come together with food, what they're shouting at each other is like, I'm really hungry! And the other like, no, oh, I'm just kind of peckish, I'm going to wait until you finish, and I'm going to get the scraps. That's what's going on right now. If he was really, really hungry, he'd be up front and center, throwing his weight around, causing quite confrontation. But this is this really boring for you guys, but I'm loving this, the fact that they're not doing, they not come together and actually fight each other, because they do fight each other, they can hurt each other, and if they hurt each other, they're done for breeding. Because they are potentially going to be breeding some of these boys in here, and if they're injured, they cannot breed. Now, I'm going to fully explain that as well. So I'll explain the hair around the backside first. That comes in three different reasons. One, they store fat around the rump of the tail. So if they store fat, the hair around the rump of the tail looks a bit more fat. Two, competition. They start off pretty devils in here, a lot less pretty, a lot less, a lot quicker. When they come together with food, and as devil goes, I want what you're having, they'll multitask, keep eating, shift that backside and block their opponent, and they get bitten around their backside of the tail. It sounds kind of intuitive, but that's where you want your devil to get bitten, because that's where they got that fat cushion to protect them. If you get bitten around the flanks, they're in trouble, because they ain't got no protection there. Now, the other reason those males use that beautiful backside ball is for breeding. Two of these boys in here have actually, right, actually was... Wooly and Deepa, so Rocky didn't breed last year. Wooly and Deepa did breed last year. What the? That actually was funny. It's not my fault you didn't breed. <laughs> In case of when it comes to breeding, it's not down to us, that's down to Zar. Zar know the genetic program of every single thing. They know what pairing is going to benefit the population, what aren't. But Zar want to give you lots of options. Because remember how large your mouth is and how big you are at back of that. So what they'll do is they'll give you breeding recommendations. All your females, two to four are on top, because females retire at four, males retire at five. Two to five, left hand side is all your males.
much rain. Hey. <laughs> I told you we gotta feed him. Thank you. 